Hello, this is Wilson Center Now, and I'm John Molesky. This program is produced by the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My guest today is Hallam Ferguson. Hallam is a public policy fellow with the Wilson Center's Middle East program, and Hal previously served as Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator at USAID. He joins us today to discuss the plight of Afghan refugees. Hal, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Well, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, certainly a couple of months ago, this story ruled the headlines around the globe. And of course, it's not over, but the world has moved on to other pressing issues. So if you could just give us an update on where we stand compared to what was happening during the initial withdrawal and the exodus from Afghanistan and where we stand today. Yeah, thanks, John. It, yeah, it, it is indeed a pressing issue that has not, in fact, gone away, although uh, many of us have moved on with our attention spans. Um, uh, yeah, the the Taliban are control of, of Afghanistan, um, and tens of thousands, perhaps as much as a hundred thousand, of our former Afghan allies are in fact still in the country. These are people who were translators, contractors, worked for various NGOs or other organizations that were working in Afghanistan with U.S. or European money, um, and they're still there. Um, we managed to get tens of thousands, maybe seventy thousand or so, out. Uh, in the final weeks uh, before Kabul, or after Kabul fell, actually, but before the United States left. Um, but a great deal are still there, and the situation is not getting any better. Uh, there's still a lot of violence on the ground there, and there is a looming humanitarian cat catastrophe as well, with the economy crashing. Thanks, Hal, for setting the scene for the discussion. And what do we know about efforts that are underway currently? Are these mostly uh, negotiations with the Taliban or are there clandestine efforts underway? What do we know about what we're doing to help those who are still left behind? Well, it's, it's, it's sort of all of the above. Um, the State Department has said that they are hopeful to begin um, uh, evacuating people again time this fall. Um, operating uh, sort of State Department run charter flights again from various cities. Um, they've said that there are about 14,000 permanent US residents that are still in the country and that will be their priority. Um, but as of yet, that, that effort has not resumed. And so in the meantime, it remains, uh, it remains the responsibility of various private actors who are doing what they can to get various former friends and allies out of the country. And these are these are NGOs, such as the one that I was with in Albania. These are uh, individual members of Congress. These are service members and just random do-gooders who are just trying to help and, and do what they can. Speaking about your trip to Albania, uh, you have first uh, hand in for, or, or, or experience with this, right? This You're not just talking about this from a distance. You know some people who've been left behind and you've worked with people who are on their way out. Tell us a bit about the circumstances of that activity and, and then what you've observed. Yeah, that's right. No, so I, uh, I worked and lived in Afghanistan for a couple of years, 2004 to 2005, um, and then traveled back and forth for a number of, of additional years. So I, I got to know a number of, of Afghans over my time there. I was working with an NGO called uh, the International Republican Institute, or IRI. And uh, when things began to unravel this last August, um, just a couple of months ago, um, I was, of course, back in touch with all of my former Afghan colleagues, uh, with IRI, about, about efforts that were underway to try and get our people out. Um, and I had the opportunity to go and volunteer with them in Albania, where uh, IRI and a couple of other related uh, nonprofits had succeeded in moving some of their people. Um, so they got about 200 people between IRI and a couple of other NGOs got about 200 Afghans and their families um, to Albania. And, and I was there to try and figure it out, right? Like set them up, uh, see what they needed uh, and try and set them on a sustainable path until their visas to the US were ready. And, and what, what's the mood like? I mean, it, uh, seems, it sounds like almost a clueless question to ask and that why should the mood be anything other than dire? But what you've, you've observed a certain amount of resilience among this population. Yeah, no, I mean, the the, the known over the years have always impressed me with their resilience, right? Um, whether it was in Afghanistan or elsewhere, they're just a very, they're very strong and very impressive people, frankly, from, from what I've, what, from what I've observed. Um, and they, they, you know, over the course of decades of conflict and terrible calamity in their country, 
they've learned to roll with the punches, right? Including the worst punches, including uh, death and, 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 and other terrible catastrophes. And so, you know, it's, it's never easy, obviously. I'm not trying to make light of the trauma these people have gone through, but um, the people I saw in Albania uh, were strong. They're looking forward to the future. They're very happy to be out of Afghanistan. Um, and um, just very impressive in, in their, their optimistic, forward-looking uh, place, which is, which is not to say it's, it's smooth sailing in, in Albania, right? They're facing challenges. Refugees around the world are dislocated from their families and from their, their natural support networks. You know, there are going to be stresses, and it's, it's always going to be hard. But, um, yeah, there are strong people looking to the future. About that degree of difficulty in working with finding permanent homes for these these folks who've been displaced, what is the infrastructure and level of cooperation necessary to accommodate those needs in place internationally? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the short answer is no, um, and yes. So so there there's a very uh, extensive infrastructure for humanitarian aid and for taking care of ref refugees throughout the world, right? Uh, UNHCR, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, is of course the flagship UN uh, program that that manages this, uh, you know, the entire process around the world. And and then there are of course many other organizations and NGOs, nonprofits that are all involved in this. Um, so so that infrastructure is there and it is global. However, many of the Afghans that wound up being evacuated from Kabul and elsewhere um, in August and in the months since are sort of falling between the cracks of, of that system insofar as these are by and large people who have applied for or are eligible for US visas, immigrant visas. There's a special immigration visa and there's what's called a P2 visa, which are two different categories of of visas for Afghans who have worked with the United States in, in some capacity in, in, in the past. Um, and so therefore they're not, they're not registering with UNHCR as refugees. Uh, and so they're not eligible for all the benefits from UNHCR. And so the humanitarian professionals as it were, aren't really engaged. Um, and instead it's kind of on the US and various US government uh, agencies and uh, various NGOs or nonprofits or individuals um, who've gotten the Afghans out to kind of take care of them while they're in the process of getting these visas. So unfortunately, um, you know, we're in a position where the sort of the, the huge complex of, of, of international organizations that normally take care of refugees just aren't very engaged in this particular and comparatively small um, um, population. You know, it's almost a perfect storm. If you look beyond the, the plight of Afghan refugees, and prior to that, we saw refugee crises uh, resulting from, say, what's happening in Syria, from what's happening with climate change, from uh, what's happening with the pandemic. And it's almost a perfect storm. And so what you've seen around the world is nations who, I don't know, I'm coining a phrase here, perhaps a refugee fatigue, mm -hmm. where perhaps they're not as welcoming as they may have been because of years and years of stress. When you look at the bigger picture, what do we need to do to begin thinking about this in the broadest context? Yeah, uh, no, it's, it's, it's very, I think, astute observation, John. The, the, the number of refugees today stands at about 83 million people, which is the highest mm. it's ever been. Um, and the, the, the funding to take care of these people in terms of humanitarian aid has quadrupled in real dollars, it's quadrupled over just about the last 20 years. And so the problem is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every year, not just in terms of people, but in terms of uh, financial resources that we primarily in the West um, are devoting towards taking care of these people. And, and I emphasize that last point because China, by most accounts, the second largest economy in the world uh, is basically not contributing anything to humanitarian aid. Um, whereas Europe and the United States are, are the preponderance of it. And it, the, the volume of the problem is actually eating into larger foreign aid efforts. In other words, um, the amount of money that we're devoting to humanitarian aid efforts is, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, whereas what we're devoting for total foreign aid isn't really. In fact, it's been declining over the last few years. 
Um, and so what you're seeing, and this is getting to the answer to your question, what you're seeing is a, a greater emphasis on the short-term Band-Aid approach. Like, oh my gosh, we've got all these people displaced from Afghanistan or from Syria or from Yemen or wherever. Um, and we're going to continue feeding them. We're going to give them shelter and take care of them. But we don't actually have a whole lot of resources left over to try and take care of the underlying causes for that displacement, right? And, and so that's, that's a real challenge. And that's something that we, I think, as as a, a, a uh, set of Western powers who are interested in helping these people need to grapple with. How are we going to really address those root causes? And that's gonna take a bit of a step back and realize that there's a longer term issue that we need to address through a variety of means. And who's focusing on that, Hal? I mean, you mentioned the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, who else would you point to globally, either organizations or individuals who are making this a priority? Yeah, well, so, when it comes to trying to address the term problems in a lot of these broken societies, here in the United States, it's, a, it's the US Agency for International Development, which is the flagship foreign aid um, agency. It's USAID's job, along with a number of other um, departments and agencies uh, in the US. But of course, that's, that's just the US. And then in Europe, of course, you've got the EU, who's very much focused on this. You've got individual bilateral, bilateral donors, UK, Germany are big ones. Um, and so, you know, a lot of folks are, a lot of different countries are focused on this, but as, as you mentioned, I think earlier in this conversation, you know, everyone's been all distracted lately, right? Um, mm -hmm. In some pretty considerable developments in the world over the last couple of years, um, which has served to exacerbate displacement, larger humanitarian crises, and sapped resources from uh, those longer term development efforts. Is there any expectation that China can be convinced to step up to the plate in a more meaningful way? I mean, you know, there are desires to be more of a global player and to continue to increase their influence. They've invested in countries via the Belt and Road Initiative. Any hope there that they will provide more assistance? China has been in recent years expanding or at least rebranding uh, their approach to foreign aid, uh, including humanitarian aid. Um, a big part of their lack of resourcing uh, is that they're not very well plugged into that international system, UNHCR in other words, and, and others. Um, and so they don't always report what it is they do. do. Um, rather, they, it's very much bilateral. They make an announcement. Maybe they actually deliver, maybe not. A lot of it is in kind. You saw a lot of their vaccine diplomacy or COVID-related assistance was very much in kind. They showed up in Morocco with a plane full of masks, for example, right, or PPE. Um, um, but in terms of an actual like larger uh, methodical strategic approach to trying to move countries um, towards self-reliance, you know, up, up, the, up the ladder of prosperity and self-reliance, there really isn't such a thing in China right now. You mentioned Belt and Road Initiative, and, and that's, that's kind of as close as they get which is really not about the development of the recipient countries as much as it is uh, connecting China and its markets to the rest of the world for uh, not always, but frequently fairly predatory reasons. Um, China has uh, found itself, uh, I think quite deliberately in a position where they have uh, had to take ownership of infrastructure in various countries because that country was unable to pay China back for these unsustainable loans that China delivered uh, to them some years ago. And now, you know, <laughs> that doesn't really count as foreign aid, right? That doesn't count as development. Um, and yet that's predominantly uh, what you're seeing from China right now. Yeah, investment for profit is more of an accurate description. Exactly. So be, uh, Hal, beyond the human suffering and the refugee crisis, when you look at the circumstances developing in Afghanistan, what are your concerns related to security and the potential re-emergence of ISIS as a major player in Afghanistan. Yeah, so there's been a lot of focus, of course, on the Taliban who have now taken over the country. Um, and, and I think a belated appreciation is beginning to emerge in the West for the fact that the Taliban are not actually the only uh, significant and serious and kind of scary players in Afghanistan. In fact, ISIS has been there since about 2015. Um, and they've been a, a, a kinetic adversary for us since about 2015. And in fact, in the past, there have been 
some efforts between the United States and the Taliban, even when we were fighting to actually coordinate our efforts against ISIS with some success. Um, now that we're out, Taliban are pretty much on their own and ISIS has shown what I'd say is actually a fairly surprising degree of on the ground capacity, um, capability in just the last few months. Uh, there's been a, a really consistent tempo of attacks on the Taliban perpetrated by ISIS as well as some pretty horrific terror attacks on civilians perpetrated by ISIS. Um, attacks on various uh, Shia mosques. Just earlier this week, there was a sort of a combined arms attack on a military hospital in, in um, Kabul. Um, all of this shows ISIS's ability to reach out and, and cause uh, mayhem throughout the country to a scale that even just a few months Go would have been really kind of unheard of or unexpected. And so all of which is to say, uh, I think a really big concern for all of us, uh, first among us, the Afghans themselves, is that actually ISIS is a much more capable and much more scary uh, adversary in Afghanistan than we all thought they were. And could at a minimum, continue this pace of just debilitating conflict in the country, right? Which has afflicted Afghanistan for decades, or at a maximum could actually carve themselves out either a piece of the country or perhaps the entire country into another one of these sort of nightmarish false caliphates like we saw in Syria and Iraq a few years ago from which they could launch attacks internationally on us, Europe or elsewhere. And what is U.S. capacity to monitor this or to intervene in any way? Pretty limited, unfortunately. Um, you know, there had been a lot of hope, I think, on the part of the Biden administration that after our withdrawal, we would still remain, we would still maintain some ability to um, remotely via drone or, or airstrike um, take out terrorist targets in Afghanistan. That seems to be really minimal now. Um, and I, I think the, the strike that we saw immediately after the bombing at the Kabul airport, in which 13 service, uh, US service people were killed, um, you know, the US reached out in a, in a retaliatory strike, hitting what it believed was an ISIS safe house uh, just a few days later. And it turned, to be it turned out to be basically an NGO worker's house and his whole family. That's what we blew up, right? Which was A, I mean, obviously tragic and terrible. B, fairly symbolic insofar as that's what the United States had found itself doing all too often uh, over the course of 20 years of occupation. And lastly, I think really put the last nail in the coffin of this idea that we in any capable way would be able to influence um, events uh, militarily in Afghanistan after withdrawing. The prospects of the Taliban itself dealing with the problem, do we have any sense if there is anything that resembles a consensus within the Taliban of whether they see ISIS as a threat to them or as a potential ally, or are we talking about sort of a split within the Taliban mm -hmm. where there are ISIS sympathizers and those who would like to see it go away? It's, it's a really complicated picture. Um, I think at the very high level, uh, the Taliban and the ISIS are adversaries, right? They've got very different visions for Afghanistan, different visions for the world, different religious uh, ideologies. Um, and in fact, they have been fighting one another for years now, right? And so at the high level, it, it's clear that they're, they're enemies, right? And then and to some extent, they've been competing to see who's, who's the, you know, the, the greatest tormentor of, of, of the infidel, right? Um, and the Taliban, in fact, sort of took some, some bruising embarrassments when it appeared that they were sort of letting us go peacefully in August um, when ISIS got, got the last like punch on us um, with the attack on, on the airport. That's an example of how the Taliban and ISIS are sort of jockeying for, for position um, in Afghanistan. However, I think below that top level, things get really muddy and confusing. Um, I've been speaking to a couple of Afghans uh, just in the last couple of days who have gotten out. Um, and they paint a picture in the country of a real sort of mottled uh, mixture of extremists in which, you know, former Taliban are now police chiefs in districts um, who are 
using their new positions to uh, um, persecute former enemies, either uh, members of the Afghan Armed Forces or government or NGOs or just you know old enemies that they're mad at, right? Um, and then you've also got other extremists who might be very extreme Taliban or perhaps even ISIS, who are sometimes cooperating, sometimes they're at odds. Um, and so what I'm sort of left with is a picture of an Afghanistan where any kind of semblance of rule of law and order has really broken down, um, even within what we had all, I think, kind of perhaps naively assumed was going to be a very rigid and serious Taliban regime. It's not serious and rigid. They still haven't figured it out. And one of the greatest concerns we've got now is that the country really does descend into a, you know warlordism or anarchy. Taliban just cannot control it. Um, and their own extremists intermingle with ISIS, are fighting one another and us, uh, all from this ungoverned space. Almost a timeless uh, lesson, right? That revolutions are easier than governing. Absolutely. Yeah. Before we close, Hal, I want to ask you about the piece you wrote for the new WQ, uh, the Wilson Quarterly, uh, an entire issue devoted to displaced people, a fantastic issue. I'd recommend it to all of our viewers who haven't read it yet. It's available free at wilsoncenter.org, at wilsonquarterly.org as well. Uh, tell us about the piece that you authored for that edition. Yeah, so it was it was uh, kind of a, a personal piece, I'd say. It was it was about my time in Albania. Uh, when I got to go out uh, with IRI to, to help these people coming out. Um, and, you know, I, I knew some of them. I, I hadn't seen them in years. Um, in fact, the last time I'd seen some of them, I was, I was letting them go because our, our program was, was downsizing and I, I had to um, end some of their jobs. And so <laughs> the next time I saw them was in Tirana, in Albania, um, as they were coming out of Afghanistan under very different circumstances. And so for me, it was a very personal experience to, to read with some of these folks. Um, but it was also for me, a, a, you know, a really interesting uh, hands-on and direct experience with a humanitarian response, right? These were people who were coming out of Afghanistan with little else besides a suitcase, you know, like a couple changes of clothes. That's all they had, right? After a pretty traumatizing few weeks um, in Kabul, in which they saw their entire world fall apart around them, right? They had spent 20 years living in one world, and then all of a sudden, over the course of just a couple of weeks, it all came crashing down around them. Next thing they know, and lucky for them, they're in Albania, right? Um, on their way to America eventually. Um, and, and so it was a really very kind of personal experience for me to try to get to know these people, uh, try to help them to whatever extent I could and, and, and realize how hard it is uh, just logistically uh, uh, taking care of people who've been displaced from everything they've known and everything they've ever owned um, and it, it's, it's not easy. And, and a final word on this, I, I'll say that, you know, the government of Albania was very generous um, in opening their arms uh, to these Afghan evacuees. Albania didn't have to step forward uh, to do this. They're a small country, um, uh, but they really were one of the first to say, hey, you know, if Afghans need to come here, we'll do it. And that's, that's, part, of, that's part of who they are. They've, they've, um, they welcomed a Cost of our refugees during that war, um, even as far back as World War II, they were very generous towards uh, to Jews fleeing, fleeing um, uh, Nazi persecution. So, um, you know, really hats off to the government of Albania. Um, and I, I think this just underscores the last theme, I think, that is uh, frequently cited in the, in the Wilson Quarterly edition you were talking about, John, which is, you know, there's the refugees and then there are the host communities. And it's not easy on either population. And you've got a whole different variety of, of host countries and communities around the world, some of whom are really happy to have refugees, or at least a few, some of whom are extremely unwelcome. And it's it, either way, uh, it's really hard on everybody. And um, I think the evacuees who found themselves in Albania were very lucky to find themselves in a place that was as welcoming as the Albanians are. You know, that kind of generosity of spirit that you recognize in Albania is the kind of thing that provides hope during these dark moments. So thank you for highlighting that. Thank you for helping us understand the big picture of the geopolitical aspects of this, but also putting a human face on it where, where it really the rubber hits the road. Yeah, thank you, John. This is great. Thanks so much.
Okay, appreciate it, Hal. Great having you at the Wilson Center. Our guest is Hal Ferguson. You can find more of his work in the Middle East program, where he is a public policy fellow at wilsoncenter.org. And as we both talked about, the issue of the Wilson Quarterly is available to you there as well. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center now, and that you'll join us again soon. On Till then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here. Thank you.